Hello, I'm Craig Blake. The message you're about to hear, if diligently applied, will absolutely change your life. So grab your Bible, notebook, and pen. Be ready to take notes, because I'm praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, thereby allowing the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened. So God bless you. We'll be back at the end of the program. Now, many of the things that we have already said are in the scriptures following on. So just because I didn't read them doesn't mean that um, I mean, that you're not getting the information because I've already said them. And as you read through these, you will see what I've said in them and you'll be able to underline them. And I made these for you so that you can go in and study it out and just take time. It's not so much <clears throat> going in and breaking down every sentence and looking at every Hebrew or Greek word or whatever it is. It's just reading what it says and getting that in you. And when you start reading a lot of scripture on a certain topic, then it heads you in that direction, and then the Spirit picks it up and starts teaching you. And so I have faith in the Spirit of God in you to pick that up and to bring you to fruition. We're giving you the basics. We're giving what you need. But And honestly, if you're not going <clears> to <throat> study it out, even if I took time to go through every detail, it wouldn't help you. Right, because it would not be in your life. So, so let's look at page twenty-eight. We're talking about sowing and reaping. It's not a kingdom principle; it's an earthly principle. But now, listen. I'm not putting it down. It is a principle. It is true. It is a spiritual law. It will work. Right? <clears throat> you can let it work for you, or it will work against you. So you have to decide which aspect of that you're going to be in. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, it says, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Now, this is where the law of sowing and reaping was established. Okay, in the sense of now, in God's mind, it was established beforehand. It was part of uh, everything about, uh, you know, the, the earth and how God made the earth. But the key is, here is where God gives his promise that seed time and harvest will not cease. Okay? So there will all, now, seed time and harvest is just an <clears throat> Old Testament way of saying sowing and reaping. That's all it is. So, sowing and reaping will last as long as the earth lasts. Okay? Now, even though it was referring primarily to physical seed and a harvest time, it is a principle which is established both physically but also spiritually. Now, it's not kingdom law, but it is an earthly law, and as long as there's an earth, it is a fact, even spiritually. Does that make sense to you? So it's an earthly law <clears throat> that also applies in the spirit, but it's not a spiritual law in the sense that this is how God wants us to operate. He wants us to operate according to kingdom law, right? Or kingdom principle, as we would say. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, we've already read this. Therefore, I say unto you, <clears throat> take no thought for your life. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on, is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment, or clothing. Behold, now this is where we, it's amazing, because this is talking about sowing and reaping, but I want to show you something here. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap. You hear that? The birds do not sow, and they do not reap. Now, they can't reap if they don't sow, right? Reaping only follows sowing. So if a bird doesn't sow, it can't reap. But does a bird eat? Right? So a bird eats, but that eating is not reaping. Right? He's feeding, he's being fed, but he's not reaping. Now, apply that to a human. Okay? Now, watch. <clears throat> Behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Who feeds them? 
Heavenly Father, right? <clears throat> are you not much better than they? Well, are you not? Okay, you are, right? Okay, yeah. <clears throat> you have to go into the new man here and teach you who you are in Christ. <laughs> now, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment or clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Now, <clears throat> notice he is using the birds and the flowers to illustrate the care of your heavenly Father. And if he will take care of birds and flowers, then again, how much more will he take care of you? So really this comes down to a faith in God, right? Now notice that he, they didn't sow nor reap, right? Now watch verse 31. <clears throat> Therefore, why? Because your heavenly Father will take care of you. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Now, this is the main point of this scripture. For after all these things, what things? What we'll eat, what we'll drink, what we're going to wear, right? All those normal, everyday things that are necessary, right? They're necessary. But he said, don't think about those things. Don't dwell upon them. Don't, in other words, don't wrap your life around that. Why? Why? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Now, when it says Gentiles, you could also put in there pagan. You could put in there uh, people that don't have a god, right? Because that's what the pagans were. Now, the pagans had gods, but they didn't have the god. They didn't have the real god, right? They didn't have a true god. <clears throat> and he said, for after all these things do the pagans, do the people without a god seek. For your heavenly Father knows what you or that you have need of all these things, right? So you have a God, and your God is your Father, and your Father knows that you have need. Now, there's a scripture that says literally that let your request be made known unto God, right? With thanksgiving, right? And thanksgiving is tacked on to the end of a command to tell God what you need. So if you're going to tell God what you need and do it with thanksgiving, then that means that you're going to have to follow Mark 11, 22 through 24. Right. right? That means you have to tell him, you have to say those things that you want. <clears throat> and when you pray, you know, believe that your word's going to pass, right? And when you pray, believe that you receive those things that you have prayed for Amen. and you shall have them. <clears throat> so where does the thanksgiving come in? In the fact that, you're, that God has heard your prayer, granted your request, and that you have them, and you start thanking him for it even before you see it. You see that? You don't wait till you get it. Notice it says, let your request be made known unto God with thanksgiving. Right? So you tell him, but you end it with thanksgiving for the fact that he heard you, and we know that if he hears us, we have whatsoever things we ask. Right? Okay. <clears throat> so you have a heavenly Father that knows you have need of those things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, Okay, now the kingdom of God, meaning literally the rule, the reign, the supremacy of God. Okay, but seek ye first the supremacy of God, the kingdom of God, and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. You hear that? He didn't say, he's, matter of fact, no. Have you ever, like with animals, sometimes with children, uh, but but really with animals and, and different things in general, it seems like the more you chase it, the more it runs from you. You ever notice that? <clears throat> and like with a dog, you know, you try to get a dog to come to you and they won't come to you, but if you'll turn your back to it and kind of, you could even back up toward it or just be there and the, the thing will come to you. You ever notice that? But if you go after it, it'll back off. <clears throat> and it's the same thing with the blessings of God many times. You have to decide if you're going to chase it, you're going to chase it. But if you don't chase it, it'll chase you. And then most people in the church today are being taught how to chase them. And they have to keep teaching them that because the more you chase it, the more it gets away from you. Why? Because you were never meant to chase blessings. You were meant 
to walk with God. And if you walk with God, those blessings come upon you. <clears throat> but if you start chasing the blessings and you get your eyes off of God, then, the, then those blessings, will never, you'll never fully catch them because they come from walking with God. You got that? Now, again, I'm trying to give you, you know, the, the truth of Scripture, but I'm trying to give you some examples that will help you see how to function or how to operate in this. Uh, most of my life I've been involved in some type of service industry. Back when I was in fast food industry and things like that, um, I was in management. I had to count tills and or you know cash registers, <clears throat> verify sales, verify the money's there, all that kind of stuff. Uh, today, and even you know now, uh, not in my life. I've never worked at a bank, but I've talked with people that have, and. It's funny because when you work with money, if you work at a bank, after a short period of time, usually, I mean, if, you, if you're right in heart, okay, now if you're covetous or crooked or, you know, something along those lines, this may not be true, but if you're right in heart, after you work with money for a while, money ceases to be money. It's just an object that you deal with, you know? Fast food, you flip hamburgers in bank, you hand out $100 bills, right? And it's just, a, it's just something you do. It's not a matter of, wow, look at all this money. And it's not like that, unless, of course, your heart is wrong. And that's usually people end up getting in trouble, okay? Because some of it sticks to them. Well, <laughs> if you, the, I keep trying to figure out better ways to express, um, and I hate to, I want you to understand, I don't think that I'm the standard that people should be measured by, okay, or that I've attained anything at any level. I'm just, I'm just saying I've walked down a certain path, and I've learned a few things that really seem to work good and help me, and all I'm trying to do is share that with you, and I'm seeing them in Bible, in the scriptures, and hopefully you get to see them along those lines. <clears throat> you need to see money the way a a bank teller sees it to where, yeah, it's necessary. Yeah, you deal with it all the time. But honestly, it's like it's not, it's not yours, so you don't think in terms of it like it's yours. And even if you cash your paycheck and you look at your bank account and has your name on it, you don't look at it like that's my money. Because I can tell you, if you do, you're going to limit yourself to that. And you're going to limit God's helping you to where if you say this is all I've got God says well it doesn't have to be but if you lock yourself into that then it, it makes it almost impossible for him to help you <clears throat> you have to be able to see finances and financial blessings like that as, as in a way that <clears throat> it's not yours and it doesn't mean a thing except for the fact that it just lets you continue living and serve, and you can serve God. You know, it's, it, it's like, again, another illustration. <clears throat> it's like gas. You know, uh, you look at your gas tank, it gets low, you stop, you fill it back up, you keep on going. The gas only means something because it gets you somewhere. Okay, money is the same thing. Money in and of itself doesn't mean a thing. Right? And how much you have or don't have doesn't mean a thing. What counts is what, what are you doing for God? Where are you walking with God? And whenever you start looking, if your mind and your goals are more toward what God wants and you take the limits off of him in, in terms of thinking God can only help me because of this job, then God starts bringing amazing things. Listen, if, even if you limit him, to the money that you get from a paycheck. Don't limit him from the goodness that he can bring to your life, that he can stretch your money further because he can give you deals that you never, you know. We've seen amazing things happen, and we haven't asked for them. You know? But I, I firmly believe that <clears throat> I constantly expect God to somehow surprise me with blessings, you know, something. And he does. I mean, I, it's not like I'm setting my faith to get it to happen. I've seen it. 
So now I'm not surprised. I'm grateful when it happens, but I'm not surprised when it happens. And I'm not believing, but I am expecting because I know he's going to do it again. You see the difference? And so I start looking at things and, you know, they'll, what was it? Uh, well, yeah, not too long ago. This thing, me and my wife, we went somewhere and she was getting something and she, there was no price on it. So the lady was trying to ring it up and she couldn't get it to ring up. And she said, do you know how much it is? And my wife t- told her how much it was. And she kept, mo- you know, moving the thing, the little bar tag, barcode. And, kept, and finally it hit. And it was half of what my wife said it was. And she said, oh, it's half. And my wife said, well, that, that's, no, well, that's the right thing. It's right there, what it is. That's what it is. Yep, well, I guess you just, you know, get it for discount today. And my wife said, oh, that's great. You know, I'll take two of them. You know, that's, you know. But, you know. And I'm like, you know, so. But, you know. But I wasn't surprised with that because I expect God to bless us in whatever way he can. And he does, he doesn't always do it the same way. And you say, you really think God marked down the price on that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the next, you know, gripey negative person that comes through the line they got charged twice you know double of something you know not that god did it okay they just are just walking the wrong side of the road right why because good things happen to me because i expect them because i have a god who is a father who takes care of me and you know i may not need this at that price you know i may have money to pay for it but it leaves the half of that money free to do something over here you see so you can't always look at cause and effect in that sense it's just a matter of living Listen, if, if I can just break this thing in you to where you just learn to live free, you know, free of the encumbrances, free of, of having to um, think in terms of, of every penny, every dime, watching this, watching that. And I'm not saying living, you know, wasteful. But I'm saying you can expect God to meet your needs. We had, um, okay, I've never flown first class. I never have. I've always flown, you know, coach, economy, something, you know, you name it, I mean, something. And believe me, flying to Australia, economy, is not fun, okay? Amen. And so, <clears throat> but the reason I did it, and I understand if you ride first class, that's great. I mean, you get there, you're refreshed, it's good. I can, I can see the benefit of it, right? But the benefit of it, because I know that after I'm there two days, I won't even remember that flight, and I'll be back to normal, right? So for me, paying $10,000 to go from here to Australia, first class, uh, the benefit of the first class is not worth the extra $8,000 I'd have to pay to get there, right? So I'll ride, you know, scrunched up in a corner, you know, <laughs> and, you know, for two days on a plane. <clears throat> um, it's like my wife said, if, you know, well, somebody told her, well, I don't know if I would like that. She goes, let me tell you this. If you could go for two days in a shopping cart, you can fly anywhere you want to go because it's like flying. It's like going two days in a shopping cart, literally. <laughs> and so, but, you know, so I would never pay that, you know, for me. Now, if I was to invite somebody over, I would offer that to them. Why? Because I would do what I would want done for me, even though I would not do it for me. <laughs> All right. You see that? So we're going to go to Ukraine here uh, end of May. And going into Kiev, and we're going to be ministering at a healing, uh, at a church that has over 800 pastors. Uh, they all come together in this one church specifically every year to be, uh, to have a minister preach them. And they've asked me to come and to minister to these 800 and to take the DHT back out to these 800 churches throughout Russia. So we're really excited about it. Now, how many of you know Ukraine isn't the picture of stability right now? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> but. God, it's amazing because it seems like every country I go to before I get there, they break out in a war almost every time. So here we got Israel scheduled. <laughs> you know? So we're looking forward to that one. Amen. Because we're going to be there during Yom Kippur. <laughs> they got a history, you know what I'm saying? So it'll be real interesting. <clears throat> Difference is with Israel, hey, I, you know, I'll pick up an Uzi. I got no problem with that. You know, so we just jump right in. <laughs> so, but we may, actually, we've been talking about uh, possibly meeting with um, the, um, 
Israeli commandos. We get to, to possibly meet with them at their training camp there. So it's a benefit of going. I get to preach and meet commandos. Hey, it didn't get any better than that. Amen? So, but when I go to Ukraine, these, uh, these Russian pastors invited me over, and they said, we're going to fly you and our representative up in the Pacific Northwest and whoever else you want to bring with you and an interpreter, and we're going to fly you over first class. I'm like, well, I'll go just because I get to fly first class for the first time in my life, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so regardless of the war, I don't care if they're, you know, shooting and blowing up bombs at the airport. We'll fly in first class, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but <clears throat> when we went to uh, Thailand several years ago, we came in and we had to sit uh, on the tarmac for a couple of hours on the plane because they had just had bombs going off in the airport and they were checking all the trash cans because they had blew up a bomb, a couple of bombs in the trash cans. And so we're sitting on the airport and they're saying, no, we're sorry for the, for the delay, but we're doing a, uh, the bomb disposal unit is going through the airport. And we're like, where are we? What will <laughs> we land into? But it's pretty interesting. But um, <clears throat> this going first class like that, God will, you know, he, he's doing that for us. And we've had other offers to do it before, but we've always just told them no, but they've already bought the ticket. So it wasn't a matter of, you know, objecting to it, but God will do things for you. And I remember Dr. Sumrall used to tell us, he said, when you're young, go to all the hard places. And then when you get old, God will give you the easy places. So apparently I'm not old yet. <laughs> so I'm still going to some of the hard places, you know, so we'll see. But, um, you know, it's just, if you go the hard road, and just remember, listen, we are soldiers for Christ. You know, it's not about the American dream, about how comfortable we can live. We're not here to live comfortably. And there's nothing wrong with, with being comfortable in the sense of having as good a life as you can have. But I'm saying it's not about that, right? It's not about, you know, the old saying, uh, he who wins with the most toys win, or he who dies with the most toys wins. No, you're both still dead, you know, as they say. So the key, though, is to be useful for the kingdom. And if you get your mind in that way, then God can use your job to pay you to be there for him. And, but if you limit yourself to that, then that's what you're limited to. I tell people all the time, man, if you're retired, don't limit yourself to your retirement fund. Man, trust God. It says that he will, if you give, he will cause men to give unto your bosom. He didn't say the government, right? He said he will cause men to give unto your bosom. So I'm going to have to let you out of here. Anyway, we go through, um, <clears throat> I wanted to go to another. All the scripture is about you not um, thinking about what you're going to wear, not worrying about those things, but put the mission first. Right? Always know what you're here for. That's the biggest. People have that question, you know, an identity crisis. Well, why am I here? What am I here for? It's, man, that's the easiest thing in the world. You know, one of, the, one of our biggest, um, I can't say biggest sellers necessarily, but I did a, a, <clears throat> a DBI course, Bible school course, called um, uh, God's Master Plan. And in it, it's just the simplest thing in the world to go through it and say, this is God's plan. And it's God's plan for every person. Even though I don't tell you specifically what company to work for, I give you God's master plan. And so far, everybody that I've ever heard that's listening to that, they're like, man, everything just got on track. I realized what I'm here for, what I'm supposed to be doing. Everything just became clear. And it's just so simple. Once you know why you're here, everything gets simple. And you're not always wondering about this. Well, should we? Because the, one of the worst things about life is living a life of regrets or maybe even living a life of what if, you know? Well, I just don't know if I ever really got into God's will. I didn't know why I was here. didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. Man, it's simple. You know, it, it takes a little while to go through all of it, but it is really simple when you get down to it. Now, <clears throat> look at um, verse, uh, page 31. Actually, go to page 30, sorry. Um, verse 29 there says, And seek not what you shall eat, what you shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knows that you have need of these things, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Notice this is another gospel, same thing we just read. Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He says, Sell that you have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that fails not, where no thief approaches, neither moth corrupts. 
for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. <clears throat> so wherever you want your heart, put your treasure there. And Because wherever you put your treasure, that's where your heart will be. Amen? That's what I'm telling you. If you put your treasure into something, then you're always going to be worried about somebody getting it, tearing it up, breaking it, something, you know, stealing it, whatever it is. But if your heart is in the things of God, set your affection on things above. Think on these things, right? If you set your affection there, the enemy can't take that. He can't touch that no matter what goes on. That's why we've had martyrs throughout the ages that would stand there while they're being burned. You know, before they were burned, they were told, listen, if, if God's grace is good enough, then hold up one finger and we'll know that God's grace, even in your being burned alive, his grace is, is, is enough. And then when they set them on fire and they're being burned alive and they're all looking to the flames and what they see is this saint of God tied to a stake and set on fire and they hold up two fingers because his grace is more than enough. See, that's what the church has lost. We've lost a sense of martyrdom. We think that God owes us something. We think that because now with all the excess grace stuff that's going around that is not the grace of God. But yet we look at that and we start looking at it from a point of view of, well, I can do anything. And it's almost like we're standing in front of God and making fun of him saying, you know, you can't do anything about this. Well, you know, because Jesus died for it, so I can live any way I want. And you can't say nothing about it. And that's not what the grace of God is for. The grace of God is there to give you power to live above sin. See, the bad part is people talk about that stuff and the whole heart of, of grace is that God wants you to live above sin. Because you can lower the bar and say, well, nothing is sin. And you still leave the drunkard addicted to alcohol. You still leave the drug addict addicted to drugs, still in pain, still going through the withdrawals, still having all the hurt. And just because you call it something else, you're not setting anybody free. You're just alleviating your own conscience for living the way you want to. And generally, it's just because you're not born again. God did not save you just to leave you in a condition that doesn't change anything and just wipes your slate clean. He, he saved you so that he can change you so that not only is your slate wiped clean, but you can live where you don't have to get dirty again. That you can live above the sin, that you can live above the pain, you can live above the addiction, and you don't have to be a servant to things that will hold you in bondage. Amen? Amen. I just got a copy of uh, Michael Brown's book, Hyper Grace. I was just going through it. Amazing. He answers that stuff so well. If you, if you can get a copy, get it. We're going to carry it, I'm sure. It is excellent. So well written, detailed, and biblical. Amen? So, all right. <clears throat> yeah. Now, let's go on. And there's a lot here. On the bottom of page 31, it says, um, t- he's talking about the, his servants being ready, watching. And Peter said to him in verse 41, Then Peter said to him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us or even to everyone? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all he has. So here's a promise that he talks about that if you serve him and that if you go after the things of God, right, and if you're doing what you're, what's right, then he will make you ruler over his things. And it says that we are to be, well, we are made kings and priests, and we are to reign and rule on this earth. Okay? Now, if you look on page 32, it has all the lists of the parable of the sower, that the enemy sows uh, tares over and over again, different ones. But in, the, in the Luke 12, 24, it says, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. And are you, how much more are you better than them? Now, <clears throat> there is, um, yeah, actually I do want to cover this next area, but I'm going to do it tonight. Yeah, because there's a couple of things we want to hit on specifically. So, yeah, but we will finish this up, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about George Mueller and about Dr. Summerall tonight when we come back. So, You are free to go, and we will see you back here tonight at 7 o'clock. We'll pick this up and finish it up. Amen? Y'all get anything out of this? Amen. Amen. I trust this message from the Word of God has been a blessing to you. 
If you need further assistance, do not hesitate to contact us at www.jglm.org or you can write to us at P.O. Box 742-947, Dallas, Texas, 75374. If you need prayer or would like to request a prayer cloth, feel free to contact us. Now, right now, I'm going to pray. God is going to set you free right where you are. God is not bound by time or distance. So in the name of Jesus, right now, I set you free. In Jesus' name, be healed, be made whole, be free in Jesus' name. So be it. Amen. God bless you.